My name's Wolf, and through this series of videos, I'm going to introduce you to the crazy, over-the-top world that nerds like me love so much that is Warhammer 40,000. So, get comfy, buckle in, and prepare for a noob-splaining session. Okay, so we've covered the basics on Space Marines and the most commonly used weapons that those psychotic little gene-enhanced, emperor-loving killers prefer. For this basics video, we're going to look at some of the most common Space Marine vehicles. Now, sometimes the enemy is a bit too far out of range of even your biggest shoulder-mounted guns, or running across a battlefield so you can hit the enemy in the face with your chainsaw is just plain suicide. Space Marines are psycho killers, but they're not stupid. So there's three different ways Space Marine vehicles can help you deal with this problem. Firstly, bring some APCs, load up your Marines inside and drive them across the battlefield so they can personally hit the enemy in the face with a chainsaw. Two, bring some tanks with bigger guns and even longer range so they can play who can leave the biggest hole in the enemy troops. And finally, get a 10 foot tall walking weapons platform that has enough armour plating to make a World War II battleship blush. We'll start with this option. So this is a Dreadnought. Specifically, it is the Cast Affair Impact Dreadnought which has been lovingly nicknamed the Boxnaut for obvious reasons. This is the most commonly used Dreadnought pattern deployed by the Space Marines. The reason for this in law is because it's the only pattern of Dreadnought that can be mass produced. In a previous video I mentioned that Space Marine Terminator armour is officially called Tactical Dreadnought armour. That's partly down to the fact that Terminators are about 2 foot shorter than a Dreadnought and weigh less than half what a Dreadnought does. Also, Terminator weapons are slightly smaller versions of what a Dreadnought carries. When I say slightly smaller, I'm talking the difference between a 5 megaton nuke and a 4 megaton nuke. They're both going to ruin your day in a spectacular fashion, one just a little more than the other. Now you would be excused if you assumed this was just a giant mech suit akin to a battle mech or Gundam, or some other anime that wishes it was as hardcore as 40k. And you're kinda half right if you do. This is 40k and the truth is way worse. The bit in the middle, well that's known as a sarcophagus, and you can see where this is going, right? So if you're a particularly good little space marine, and as I established in previous videos, when I say a good little space marine, I mean a more effective murderous bastard than your mates. Anyway, if said Space Marine is mortally wounded in battle, they don't get to die in agony for blood loss or a mercy bullet. Oh hell no, this is 40k. So what's left of the Space Marine's body, and for it to be a mortal wound to a Space Marine means there generally isn't much left of his body, is interred into that bit in the middle, which is a super life support system, and they are then put into stasis, a form of cryosleep. Occasionally they are woken up from stasis, have extra armour bolted onto the sarcophagus, which is then inserted into that walking chassis. Then the weapons are added in a very complicated and ritualistic method by the Tech Marines that looks something like this. With the Dreadnought now fully assembled, off they go to carry on killing the enemies of the Imperium of Man. Yep, that's right, even being in a state of near death doesn't get a Space Marine a day off from smiting the Emperor's enemies. The most common setup for a Dreadnought is to have a heavy weapon on the right side and a huge power fist and flamer on the left, officially called a Dreadnought Close Combat Weapon, as some Space Marine chapters use different weapons like a giant friggin' power axe or something that is equally violent and nightmare inducing. It is entirely possible to equip your Dreadnought with two close combat weapons, but the downside with that is these things are not Olympic sprinters, and the battle's usually over before they get to the fight. Alternatively, you can have it with two ranged weapons, and it can join in the tanks playing who can make the biggest hole in the enemy. The Castafarian pattern, or the Boxnaught, has by far the most flexible loadout options. This has resulted in several variants, and I'm just going to rattle through these rather than go into each individual. So, here we go. <gasps> Assault, Hellfire, Siege, Ironclad, Mortis, Furioso, Librarian or Psychic Space Wizard and Venerable. On top of that, other notable variations of the Dreadnought pattern are Furibundus, Dereido, Contemptor and the all new Redemptor, which is for the new primary Space Marines, for when they spectacularly fail their armor saving mode. I'm sorry, but look at that thing. It just looks fat. It reminds me of that fat Autobot from Age of Extinction with all the guns voiced by John Goodman. In fact, that thing is so fat, your mama said damn. Well that's enough on Dreadnoughts for the time being, this is a basics not a deep dive. So the first option was to drive your troops to the enemy in an APC so you can hit them in the face personally with a chainsaw. The most common used APC is this, the Rhino. It's tougher than a $2 steak and armed with a couple of bolt guns, grenade launchers and smokescreen generators. 
If you have ever been to Warhammer World, they have a life-size one parked outside. However, I do feel it's like half the size of what it should be for space wings. Both for normal humans it's fine, but then normal humans are not 8 foot tall wearing armour made of space concrete. Fun fact, that Rhino they have outside is an actual APC from World War II, and is still fully operational. A Rhino is capable of transporting 10 fully armed and armoured Marines across the battlefield and personally delivering them right into the enemy's face. Now if the Rhino was an actual British military vehicle, I can guarantee you'd only be able to fit 8 in, with the other 2 hanging on the rear door for dear life. Now, it turns out, the Rhino chassis is not only easy to produce, maintain and super effective, it is also super easy to add custom aftermarket bits from anti-air missile launchers to amp speakers and furry dice on the rear view monitor, which is just more evidence that it's not a British military vehicle. Unsurprisingly, due to the effectiveness of the Rhino, its variation list is more impressive than that of the Dreadnoughts. Here we go! <sighs> Razorback, Predator, Predator Annihilator, Predator the Destructor, Whirlwind, Vindicator, Damocles, Command Rhino, Hunter, Stalker, Immolator, Exorcist, Incarcerator, Repressor, Castellan, Rhino Primaris and the M-Series Sport version with the sunroof, GPS and leather bucket seats all included in the list price. Ok, that last one might not be true, but someone needs to 3D print one, complete with a comically oversized exhaust and some space wing wearing Ray-Bans in the driver's seat. Also, for the sake of transparency, some of those variants I named are not used by the Space Wings, but they could if they wanted to. It's still a Rhino, the steering wheel hasn't changed position, unless it's a British Rhino. But pretty much every single one of those variants I listed is more tank than APC, and some are all tank and no APC. The only problem with the Rhino is you can't fit the chunky boys with the big guns that are the Terminators inside them. To deliver a Terminator to the enemy personally, you're going to need a Land Raider. Now before we go any further, I need to make a statement about a Land Raider. I fucking love this vehicle and I want 10 of them to complete my Deathwing collection. Anyway, now you know that I might be just slightly biased in my opinion of the Land Raider, let's go! This is the Mark 1 Land Raider. As you can see it takes heavy inspiration from the land ships or the first tanks from World War 1. This is both a heavy tank and a heavy APC all in one. They have over the years had some upgrades giving them more armour and weapons so now they look like this. Apart from the fact they are armed with at least 6 heavy weapons, typically two twin last cannons and two heavy bolters, additionally two normal bolters, grenade launchers and smokescreen generators, and a wide variety of optional extra death spitting guns, the damn things are harder to kill than a cockroach with Kevlar armour and a Glock. Unlike the Rhino, the Land Raider is one of the items that the Imperium is no longer able to produce due to its rare and complex armour plating composite alloys, so each Land Raider is considered a holy relic of each Space Marine chapter. Should one be immobilised in battle, it is not unknown for the Space Marines to throw their lives away to try and rescue it. Now, apart from having more firepower than the US Navy's Pacific Fleet, each Land Raider also has something unique that sets it aside from any other tank in the 40k setting, and that's its machine spirit. Now I have said that, I realise I need to do a basic video on common terms used in 40k, but in short, a machine spirit is a stripped down AI that runs all the systems on the Land Raider. Now a typical machine spirit in another tank does exactly what the drivers and gunners tell it. Initially a Land Raider's machine spirit is no different, however the machine spirit of a Land Raider is that strong, should a gunner or driver get incapacitated, the machine spirit can take over their role. A good example of this was the Land Raider named Rin's Might. Rin's Might belong to the Imperial Fish Chapter Space Marines, who are most famous for being on the cover of the Rogue Trader book and being mistaken for Ultramarines. Anyway, a bunch of orcs thought it would be a great idea to attack a Space Marine home base known as a Fortress Monastery because orcs love a good fight. During the fight, the crew of the Rin's Fist were all killed, and it is rumoured the Rin's Fist roared in anger and then spent the entire night in a rampage killing as many orcs as it could find, including the orc war boss, until it was sadly destroyed. When Bambi's mom was shot, nothing. When the Rin's Fist died, I cried like a baby. When my wife asked what's wrong, I told her I accidentally sat funny and crushed her nut. See ladies, us men do have an emotional side. It may take a fictional tank that's acting like a pit bull who just saw its owners be killed, but deep down in there somewhere we have emotions. Next on our list is the latest addition to the Space Marines toy box that got bigger when the Space Marines found their in-game loot box and became the Primera Space Marines. Around about the same time, someone at the Mechanicum, the Stark Enterprises of 40k, secretly took a Rhino into a military lab and injected it with space steroids and helium, which gives us these. Yep, a bigger anti-grav Rhino that comes in both tank and APC form, but with more guns because it's 40k, and there's no such thing as overkill, it's just making sure the job is done. This is the Gladiator and the Primaris Repulsor that replaced the Rhino Primaris. These tanks over time will become the most prominent over the Rhino variants as Games Workshop is phasing out the Space Marines in favour of the Primaris Marines. The Land Raider however will live on forever. 
it better do, as I'm only a 30 minute drive from Gings Workshop HQ and I know how to make a Molotov cocktail. We then have the fast attack and scout vehicles. These consist of bikes with guns, bikes with sidecars and more guns, and ATVs with heavier guns. Now we also get some more repulsor craft here in the form of the land speeder and its multiple variants, which just means it has a different gun for the passenger to fire. I'm not going to list the different variants of the land speeder because it is literally just a different gun. Now the more rare vehicles are the Space Marine aircraft. Yep, you get a Space Marine who weighs nearly a ton in armour, can throw a family car for several hundred metres with ease and you stick it in the cockpit of a fighter jet. You can understand why these are not used so much because they make either zero sense or are stupidly expensive. So the first one we're going to look at is the Storm Raven gunship, which takes design cues from the front end of a land raider and the dropship from aliens. Then we have a Storm Talon, which is clearly not a 40k Apache, and the Storm Hawk, that is clearly not a 40k Warthog, but with more guns. And all that ranges from £70 for the Storm Raven to £37.50 for the Storm Hawk, which in American, when you take into account the price hike for shipping it abroad that Games Workshop unfairly puts on everything they market outside the UK, means they vary in price from a small operation at the hospital to buying a new house. Of course, if you're going to go all in on a flying gunship slash dropship, then you want the Thunderhawk. However, at 575 quid UK, and I don't even want to think about what it costs in dollars, but if you can afford one of these, then you can make an up and coming YouTuber happy and buy me a Land Raider. Any Land Raider, even if it's a second hand one off eBay, I just always wanted a Land Raider. Now both my parents left long before I was born and my step parents said I had to live in the cupboard under the stairs and that I was never enough of a good boy to deserve one. But that bastard down the road who also lived under the stairs with a scar on his head got all the lucky breaks. Anyway, that's about enough for this video. Now that the turmoil of the announcement of what is happening for 40k 10th edition is beginning to settle, I've managed to retrieve some of those 20 scripts I threw out of the window. However, with this being the UK and there recently being a bank holiday weekend, it rained. So they're absolutely fucking wasted like I intend to be in about an hour. But at least I have a plan again. The next few videos will cover the basics on terminology and the world and history of 40k so far. And then as this is supposed to be an educational slash entertaining way of learning about 40k, I might have to do a mini quiz on what you've learned so far. And there we have it. Don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment. Better still, if you know somebody who could do with a bit of noob splaining on Warhammer, then share this video with them. And at any point, if you learned something or laughed, then please hit that subscribe button. I won't ever be doing a Patreon or a merch store, so that subscribe button is the best way you can show your support and thanks from me.